2021 Integrated Fertility Symposium. My name is Lauren Brown. I'm your IFS chair. A big thank you to our moderators um, and tech team, Sandra Grassa and Lauren Sloan White. And a very special thank you and appreciation to our speakers today, um, Dr. Noah Rubenstein and Dr. Lucky Seacon. I'm going to do a little bit of housekeeping before we get into the lecture. Our topic, though, so you know where you're, what you're listening to, is how to help patients understand and prepare for the COVID vaccine from an Eastern and Western perspective, and in particular, how to have this conversation and educate and communicate with um, women that are and men that are trying to conceive or are currently pregnant or are currently breastfeeding, because there's lots of questions um, on a regular basis. And so we thought we'd have this lecture where we could hear some of the data, find out what some of the concerns are, um, some of the risk and benefits, and have a really good um, educational talk and a great discussion as well. So do post your questions during the chat. I just want to remind you, this is one of the pop-up lectures as part of the IFS. Um, and so we will, we've extended the IFS until August 31st, 2021. And so to remind you guys um, that if you, um, that you can um, continue to watch your CEU approved courses, and we'll be offering more pop-up lectures and panels and sponsor talks um, during the month of July and August. So do keep checking out the conference calendar. I will let you know today, you can see here's our talk about the COVID. Um, and on 30th, we just added this one. This one's gonna be quite interesting. Um, Dr. Tracy Malone is a naturopathic physician. I just wanna give you a heads up about this one so you can plan to attend. Um, she's a, her, their clinic is inside an IVF center. And so they're looking at 10 years of preconception care data diet, supplements, acupuncture, and they're looking at those women that are doing IUIs or IVFs, and they were looking at the outcomes, pregnancy rates, live birth rates. Um, the data is not published yet, um, but she has permission to share some preliminary data um, with us, and I know it's positive, and so this is kind of the stuff we've been wanting to hear about. We all know about acupuncture and transfer data. There's lots of research on that, but what about all that preconception care that we talk so much about? Well, here's a clinic that has um, looked at 10 years of data and are ready to publish that. And I think it's gonna be quite interesting. So do mark your calendars for that for June 30th. I want to remind you as part of the IFS, we have do, hold on, I got unmuted. Do remember to check out the forms um, um, because we have discussions happen in the lectures and case studies area. Um, your sponsors are giving you some special coupons and discounts. And then we'll always keep um, publishing in the live events anything new that's happening. Um, again, a big thank you to our sponsors. A big shout out to the Jane app as our platinum sponsor. And they all have lectures on their pages. So if you're interested in more content, check out that. And to remind you, as part of the IFS, when you go to the dashboard, these are your CEU lectures that show up when you log in as a dashboard. So a lot of people have been asking questions. You have until about the CEUs. You have until August 31st to access the website to complete your CEUs. So you should be working through those lectures now to get your continuing education credits. Um, and they're all, there's 16 lectures there that add up to a maximum of 36 hours. You get what you get to complete up until August 31st. If you haven't completed it by August 31st, you do lose access. Um, so do your best to complete as much as you can. I do wanna remind you that we've created some public education videos. We've gotten our some of our speakers and experts to do talks that are meant to educate the public, to inspire them for this integrative care. So we have several um, duly trained REIs, IVF specialists and Chinese medicine doctors, like they have both, they've done the schooling for both and practice both. And they have shared some of the research and clinical um, cases that, that they see. And so it's really nice to share these are five 15 minute videos and those are available to you as part of the IFS. And then we have sponsor lectures and then a lecture like today, the pop-up lectures, this will show up in your account as well to watch later as a recording. So I just wanna remind you um, of that. All right, let's get to our topic and our introduction to our speakers. Our topic today is how to help patients understand and prepare for the COVID vaccine from an Eastern Western perspective. And as I mentioned, it's also to have that discussion 
um, for those um, that are trying to conceive or already pregnant or are breastfeeding. Um, Dr. Noah Rubenstein, he's the clinical director of the Innova Center in New York City. He's a board certified acupuncturist and a clinical herbalist. And he's also a New York State paramedic. I always like that part of your Eastern Western uh, background, um, Noah, um, with certifications, advanced cardiac life support, um, pediatric event life support, and neonatal resuscitation. Um, and again, he has his doctorate of traditional Chinese medicine from PCOM. Also, we got Dr. Laki Sikon. Now she is a fellow Canadian, but she is living abroad in the States, in New York. Um, she did her undergrad at McGill. We're fellow alumni. I did, I did one of my degrees at McGill as well. She did her medical degree in Ireland. Hey, uh, Sandra, our, one of our tech moderators. So there you go. You got a connection to Sandra there. And then she did her OBGYN and reproductive specialty in New York. And she is practicing in the New York, Manhattan, downtown Soho area at RMA of New York. All right, let's bring up the presentation slides as we get ready to start. One last reminder is that this is for educational purposes only. This is not intended to be medical advice, so should not be perceived as medical advice. If you have a health condition, please seek out a qualified healthcare provider because this is for educational purposes only. Throughout this lecture, please post your questions. We'll moderate those questions. And then during the Q&A, we'll bring those both to um, Dr. Lucky and Dr. Noah. All right, if we can give control to Lucky for the slides, we'll have her kick off this um, informative discussion. Oh, we have to let her unmute herself too, guys. Hold on, we're still muted, so we're going to help you unmute. I just, I, I figured okay. it out. God, yeah. it. <laughs> you would think like 18 months into the pandemic, I would have zoomed <laughs> down. But um, anyhow, thank you for having me. I'm really excited to be here um, and invited to speak on this topic. Um, as I was introduced, you know, I'm an REI from New York City. Um, and I guess you would class of my, classify me as coming from the Western medicine realm, but something to know about me is that I like to take an integrative uh, multidisciplinary approach. Um, I've always really believed in combining both Western and Eastern med medicine practices. And I've worked alongside Noah and his colleagues at the Yanova Center, um, you know, in treating my patients and educating patients, because I think that really combining both approaches is key and um, is going to be the most helpful strategy for our patients. And that's what this is all about. That's why we're gathered here today to talk about this topic. It's really about being able to have an informed, educated conversation with patients, um, not necessarily telling them what to do with their bodies or being paternalistic, but giving them the tools and the information um, you know, the challenge of this pandemic um, for a lot of us, you know, this is an unprecedented once in our lifetime event that taught us as practitioners how to think on our feet, how to make the best decisions possible with limited information. All of us love to have the class one data, the randomized control trials, but we didn't have that at our disposal and we just had to do the best with the information we had. And that was very true of this issue of vaccines, particularly back in December, January, when they first obtained emergency use authorization. Um, I was getting flooded with questions from my patients and you know, I had to use the scraps of information we had because those initial trials did not involve and purposely excluded pregnant women or those trying to conceive and really give them you know, all of the tools to make the best decision for them. I had a lot of patients who were in, who met eligibility criteria early on. They were teachers, doctors, um, and some of them had conditions that made them immunocompromised. So I knew that it wasn't, my gut told me it was not right to say, there's no data, so we just don't know, so let's err on the side of caution and don't do it. We really had to, to think more deeply than that and think outside the box, and it was really challenging. So um, I've really kept my ear to the streets when it comes to this issue. Um, I had you know, both professional interests and personal interests. Um, I was pregnant throughout the pandemic. I was about 18, 19 weeks when it first hit New York City in March. Um, and I, you know, self-isolated as much as I could, but as a doctor, that's kind of impossible. Um, and if a vaccine had been available when I was pregnant, it could have been a game changer for me. I have asthma and it was, you know, a really
really scary time. So I feel really passionate about it from a, a personal perspective. I also have a patient who just got um, you know, out of the hospital after being in the ICU for a month and had her baby delivered by emergency C-section at 29 weeks because she was so sick with COVID. She was intubated in a coma. So um, this has really hit me in a lot of uh, different ways, both personally and professionally, and that's why I'm here today. So, you know, I have no financial interest in any of this. I have nothing to disclose from that perspective. Um, I really just care about my patients, and I was pregnant in the pandemic, and, and that's basically my only disclaimer or disclosure. Um, the things that I want to talk about today, there's a lot of information. Um, you know, I kind of want to just take a step back and look at where we were when it first all happened and where we're at now and kind of a reality check um, to talk about the different COVID vaccines that are available and how they work. And then to really touch upon the efficacy and safety of the vaccines and what the potential concerns were um, and you know what myths have since been debunked about the impact on fertility and reproductive health. Um, also, you know whether to get the vaccine during pregnancy, common questions that come up about breastfeeding. And then I'm also gonna be handing it over to Noah to talk about some of these issues as well as focusing on um, strategies that we can lend our patients on how to best deal with side effects and prepare for the vaccine. So this is, um, you know, straight from the CDC. Uh, this figure shows different countries that were hit particularly hard in the pandemic and the rates of daily confirmed new cases, um, you know, from the beginning of the pandemic in March, 2020 and now. And obviously we're all going through different phases of the pandemic in different waves at different times. And it's almost like a game of whack-a-mole. Um, but this is a really sobering graph that shows how long-winded this crisis has been and how, you know, it's, it's not over. Um, so the overview is, you know, what we know about COVID infection and fertility and pregnancy now a year or more going on in this pandemic is that actually becoming ill with COVID has no known impact no known long lasting irreversible impact on fertility. Um, definitely on the female side. We do have studies that on the male side um, suggesting that there can be a transient and quite marked decrease in um, sperm quality. Um, I've seen it in some of my own patients where there is an unexplained lack of sperm um, you know, a few months after COVID um, in, in male patients, but there's always recovery. And this makes sense when we think about the fact that the ACE receptor, which is one of the receptors used to enter the body that, that the virus uses, um, is found in multiple organ systems, including uh, testicular tissue. Um, so we know that it can transiently impact male fertility. There's no apparent impact on female fertility. Um, and when it comes to pregnancy, we know that COVID infection does increase the risk of hospitalization, does increase the risk of needing help breathing with mechanical ventilation, and it can have fetal impacts. Now, early in the pandemic, what was scary about it is, you know, everyone was thinking about Zika. We know now that this does not appear to have any relationship to birth defects, thankfully, um, but it can indirectly affect fetal or infant health because a lot of um, women who get very sick during pregnancy um, will require being delivered early um, because it creates more space for lungs and ventilation. And sometimes you see fetal deterioration um, where you know it's in both mom and baby's best interest to deliver early. And preterm labor has a whole host of uh, bad outcomes associated with it, some of which you're not gonna discover till later in life. Um, there is a question of whether the actual infection itself can impair blood flow through the placenta. So we'll talk about that. And there's also evidence that when you get the infection in pregnancy actually determines the level of antibodies detected in the newborn. Um, and that data is quite compelling. In terms of breastfeeding, it's generally considered safe for women who are infected with COVID to continue breastfeeding. Um, it is something that is managed on a case by case basis, um, but some women who are sick at time of delivery, um, you know, were able to wear their mask and breastfeed their babies and room with their, their babies. And sometimes they kept them in isolate or six feet away, but um, it's not an absolute no-no. And we know that breastfeeding after having a recent COVID infection or even 
um, after the vaccine does allow for the transfer of antibodies through breast milk 